a regular meeting of special. Well, actually, it's a special meeting of OPC to order for Wednesday, April 15th. Uh, first, I, I hope that all of my friends on the call today are, are healthy and well and that your families are doing okay in these very unusual times. Um, what I would love to ask uh, in our new teleconference world is if you could please put yourself on mute until it's time to speak or until you'd like to ask a question. That'll make things a little bit clearer here on this end uh, for TV79 who is covering our OPC meeting this morning. Um, so with that, why don't we get started and um, I will ask if Tara would like to report first today. Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, we are in, I think as you all know, um, a new mode and kind of paradigm of learning with our e-learning. Um, we certainly have learned a lot and grown a lot. Um, I'm really, quite frankly, proud of our staff and our administrators for putting it together and, quite frankly, to families and students who are adjusting to this whole new environment and um, giving us really good feedback on, on how things are going, both good and bad, um, and being really patient with it and really stepping up to the bar. So I will say most of our feedback has been quite strong um, and we uh, I will say I talk with board chairs around the state at least once weekly and uh, it, I think Darianne really has has a great model for how we are doing that so I think we certainly can be proud I think some of our investments in the past things like one-to-one -one learning um, really have shown that in these situations which we never could have predicted um, really have helped us to continue education for students. So with that, we have been meeting. Um, our superintendent, we did grant some specialized authority um, in the eventuality that we couldn't meet, but luckily we have been able to keep to our regular meeting schedule and do regular review of activities and materials. Um, and so I am proud of our board members for stepping up and really being able to be there. Um, we met last night. Uh, as part of that, I did report out to the uh, Board of Education um, based on both my conversations with Chairman Zagrowski and in viewing the Board of Finance meeting that it would appear the Board of Education should at least anticipate a request for modification to the budget. Um, they are all ready for the work ahead of them. So as the Board of Finance and the RTM finalize their process, um, just know we're ready to go into gear when you um, when you're ready to give us the material. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions. There's been so much material, if there's anything prudent to any of the other town bodies, I'm happy to, you know, to kind of answer where where you might be. Um, and we, we continue to plug along and adjust as needed. Anybody? My, oh, it, this is Steve O'Vanny. Um, my only question is, and I've tried to keep up as best I can, with regards to Ox Ridge, has the state um, adjusted any of the filing deadlines to your knowledge that you know of? Because we're under the premise that we're still keeping the same dates. Um, so I can answer what I know. John, you might be able, um, I, know, I know you're stepping down from the committee and we will miss you, but Dan will be a great addition. You can feel free to add on if you know anything differently. But um, as far as I have been told by the state, um, deadlines for projects um, and additionally deadlines for an anticipated reimbursement of state grants um, continue to be on schedule. John, I don't know if you have anything different. Yeah, I, I would concur with that. I've heard no, nothing from the state that would suggest changes in those deadlines. Most, most changes in deadlines are for things that are due, like taxes and what have you. I haven't heard any change in uh, when, when those particular decisions would be made. Okay, that, that confirms uh, what I've seen told and know, um, and we're trying to, from p and perspective, what we're talking about is we're trying to keep you guys um, on schedule as best that we can from our end as well. So that's all my other question. Okay, any other questions for Tara? 
Uh, no, I would just like to add that I've gotten nothing but great comments, Tara, about the teaching staff and their interactions with the students. And it was actually really heartwarming, the extraordinary efforts that the administration and the staff went to to make the kids feel connected. I saw a number of those videos and my hat's really off to the hard work that they're doing, remembering that many of them are home helping their own kids e-learn and running a household while still trying to be online and teaching our kids. I, I'm not quite sure how they're doing it, but they seem to be doing it very well. So I extend um, on behalf of uh, the entire town our gratitude for that. Yeah, I would just, I would like to just add quickly into that, that um, I think our staff and our administration has done an amazing job that you show that, and you really show teaching for calling and how much they care about kids. Um, their own home lives are as disruptive as, as ours, and um, they, they really have kept teaching and learning at the forefront. So, um, yeah, I, I share in that sentiment, and uh, we continue to be proud of them and try to support them through this difficult time. But thank you, and I will make sure they are aware of that. That's great. Okay. Um, can I, good morning. Can I add one thing to that, Sammy? Yeah, sure. Let me just ask, was that Seth? Have you joined Seth? Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I, 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 I suspect that I'm the only one of us three that are at least on here that has a high schooler, maybe besides Tara, but I can tell you that my kids and their students in the Darren schools are taking this really dead seriously and are embracing the e-learning and working really hard and, you know, listening to all the teachers that I get to listen to some of the classroom stuff too. Some of the teachers are really smart when it comes to economics. So I think the kids are doing a great job, and the teachers are doing a great job. Yeah, I, thanks, Steve. I appreciate that. I agree. You know, keeping in mind too that it's it's a bit heartbreaking to think about the things that, um, in particular, the seniors are missing this you know spring season. And I I do hope that we can get to a point here in Connecticut where the kids. Oh can go back to school, even if it's for a short time, to reconnect with their teachers and their peers and have a graduation. I, I hope that that's um, in the minds of those who are making those decisions for that to be a goal if it's safe to do so. So I do think, and we discussed this last night at our meeting too, um, and, and just for what it's worth, I'm not sure it's town body-wise, but certainly town morale-wise, um, the seniors are all being reached out to for ideas about graduation, should we not return? Quite frankly, even for ideas for things like prom and what that could look like. Um, because I think what we want to do is include them in any decision. There is so much change that they are facing. Um, and so the high school administration has reached out to all the seniors to try to solicit ideas and um, come up with a creative way. But rest assured, there certainly will be something to honor all their achievements. Um, and in some cases, this is people's culminating graduation event, and we wouldn't want them to miss that. And for others, and for all, quite frankly, it is it is really um, the end of your, educate, your public education here in Darien, and we will find a way to mark that um, to the best of our ability as this all goes forward. That's great to hear. Thanks, I, I Tara. Can, I, I can tell you from a high school senior's perspective, and I've got a daughter that's a high school senior, she's still trying on prom dresses and graduation dresses, and every day we get something in the mail from Amazon that she tries on. So they're still positive, I can tell you that. That's good. I'm glad they're positive. Right. Okay, um, Steve, why don't you continue with your planning and zoning report, please? Sure. Um, from, from my perspective, um, myself and the, and the Plain Zoning Commission and the Plain Zoning Department want to keep the ball moving on a bunch of different applications that are out there and, and projects that are out there, be it um, Sorbonne Drive, Oxford School, um, and some other ones that are, have distinct deadlines and also the Playhouse. So we did have our first uh, virtual meeting last night. Um, we used GoToMeeting. Uh, all six commissioners were on on the phone, we had three staff on phone, we had applicants on the phone. At one point in time, there was 22 people on the um, go-to-meeting call. 
uh, we got through two applications, you know, we reviewed minutes, deliberated on stuff, and, and kept the ball moving forward. Um, I don't need to get into any of the, the, the details of, of that stuff, but, you know, the, those, the, our plan is only important to still open. They're still accepting applications, and, um, you know, our goal is to keep the ball moving. Uh, the most stuff that is is very important to you know our residents and our business owners and um, developers in town. Um, that that's pretty much it from from my perspective. Um, but I just want to you know make sure that we all know that and make sure I know dates and whatnot that that does come up on on um, the side of the world. Any questions for me? You know I'm here. Thank you, Steve. That's great. I'm really happy to hear that we're we're finding a way through with our go-to-meeting virtual protocols here. Um, so I think that's that's excellent, and it's a good reminder to the public that that um, we're in a uh, uh, skeleton staff posture here in town hall, but we are open for business. Any other questions yeah. for Steve? Okay, um, Seth, have you joined? Okay, no, Seth. Then we'll move on to John. Thanks, Jamie. Good morning, everyone. So <clears throat> the big topic for the Board of Finance right now is the budget process. And obviously, there's a, there are a few changes and issues to discuss with all that, which I'll just outline briefly in which we spoke about at some length at the Board of Finance meeting last night. Um, the first one is around what to do with regard to the proposed budget uh, given coronavirus and the many uh, difficulties and struggles uh, our town residents and town businesses are facing. And so there have been a number of discussions back and forth, including town residents, but also town officials. And, and Jamie, of course, you've spoken out on this as to where we should take things from here. <clears throat> Obviously, we have proposed budgets from both, both the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Education. and. Uh, the Board of Finance process for reviewing those budgets is starting now. So the first thing to know is that uh, the Board of Finance process has actually been delayed by about 30 days. And given coronavirus, the governor issued, has issued a number of executive orders, but one of those essentially delayed our process by about 30 days. So we're going to be starting our review this month uh, very shortly with discussions about the budget in early May, and I'll touch on some dates for all that in a minute. Getting back to what to do about the budget, uh, I know, uh, Jamie, you have talked about requesting a 0% mill rate increase or seeing if we could accomplish or strive towards that as part of our review process. Uh, I'm in agreement with that as a goal or objective, and so we're going to be taking a careful look at what it would take to get there. And we have several work streams planned to, to try to do that. The first thing we need to do is we need to translate a 0% mill rate increase into a dollar figure. And as discussed, Jamie, I think this this dollar figure is actually, I don't want to, we don't want to characterize that so much as a cut, but more of a deferral. So what we're going to see if we can do is defer as much work or activity or spending as we possibly can uh, into future years. And so this could be deferring some capital projects, deferring payments into reserve funds, deferring as, as much as we can to try to minimize the budget for next year. So we're going to be taking a close look at how we translate that 0% mill rate increase into a dollar amount to defer out of next year's budget. The second thing that we'll do is, coming up is the analysis that's required to determine that number. So there's a lot of moving parts. We need to think about uh, how much in state grants are at risk. We need to think about uh, program revenue that we more normally might have expected, for example, uh, summer parks and rec programs. We need to think about um, the collection rate, right? We've historically had a high collection rate of taxes. Uh, that actually could be lower this time around. So we're going to take a look at a number of factors to try to uh, come up with our best estimate of what the dollar amount needs to be in order to get to a 0% no rate increase. And then finally, once we get that figure, we need to figure out how to allocate it between the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Education budget. So our plan is to do that analysis in the coming week, and we're going to call a special meeting of the Board of Finance either for late next week or the early part of the following week 
to present that analysis to the public uh, and get as much input as possible and then uh, provide really the dollar figures that we would recommend both the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Education uh, come up with. So more to come on all of that in terms of our process. In terms of calendar, I close with um, another change that everyone should be aware of, which is that there's been a separate executive order from the governor that uh, essentially says for towns like ours that have a representative town meeting, the change in the process is going to be that the RTN is going to vote to delegate final budget authority to the Board of Finance. And the reason for this, obviously, is the RTN is a large body and <clears throat> this solves the problem of having to convene that body in person uh, to get this done and keeping in mind that it's not just a simple vote but a long deliberative process that the RTN typically has with its annual budget. So the current plan, uh, again, everything is in a state of flux and could change, but the current plan is that the RTM is meeting virtually or in some, some way, shape, or form on April 27th to discuss this and vote to grant this authority to the Board of Finance. Uh, once that's done, and assuming that it's done, our intention is to actually maintain a, an extremely collaborative process with the RTM as we do our work to review and finalize the budget and mill rate vote. So we will continue the system of collaborating with members of F&B as well as a more expensive group of our RTM members uh, in our budget review so that they can be part of the process and make sure that their questions and views are, are fully aired as, as part of our work. And so that vote will take place on April 27th. Our reviews are going to be over three days, May 5th, May 7th, and May 12th, where we'll cover both the Board of Selectmen and Board of Education budgets. And then on May 14th, we will have a final vote on the budget, as well as a vote to set the mill rate. And uh, that would be our final vote. I'm, I'm still exploring, by the way, whether we should try to get a second vote on the mill rate uh, on June 10th, which is, was the original date that the RTM was going to vote itself. That would just give us the maximum amount, amount of time to see how the economy is changing, see whether we're able to open the economy, which again will inform and our decision about what to do with regard to the budget for next year. Uh, finally, I am uh, in the process of writing an article for the uh, Darien Times and Darien News to get out uh, towards the end of this week. It will explain all this in detail. Uh, a theme of that article is going to be uh, transparency and public input. We want to hear from anyone who has a point of view on all this. We're going to do our absolute best to uh, minimize the budget for next year and get as close to a zero mill rate increase as we can uh, without, by the way, damaging uh, town services or assets. I continue to believe that we're going to eventually get out of all of this. And if you believe that that's true in the medium to long term, whatever we do today, that shouldn't set us up for future failure. And by that, I mean that we don't want to do something that is so draconian that uh, we damage our, the services we provide as a town, both to our residents and our students, or, or the assets we have. I don't want to irreparably damage those or make it expensive to repair them if we, if we uh, make overly draconian cuts. So we'll keep all that in mind as part of this process. And I look forward to collaborating with everybody on this call as well as the other town boards as uh, and members of the public as we uh, work through this process. Thank you, John. That was very clear. I appreciate that and uh, also appreciate your efforts in uh, the article that you're going to write to detail the Board of Finance's process going forward. Uh, Kate, do you have a question? Uh, just a comment. Um, I just, for the public who may be watching, um, all the efforts to keep the mill rate level um, just the result of the revaluation may mean even if the mill rate is kept level may mean different things to different people um, depending on where you are assessment went um, a level mill rate may mean an increase or a decrease in taxes that is correct yeah that's a great that's a great point and I that's a, another uh, item that I'll stress or, or make sure I explain in this article because I think the overall theme of this is I don't want people to be surprised, right? There's going to be, uh, an effort, even if there's a flat overall mill rate increase, uh, your results may vary, as, as they say on television, and it's going to depend on individual circumstances, and I'll make that clear in the article so people uh, can understand uh, uh, that, that particular nuance. That is correct. Uh, John, would you like to touch? Oh. Go ahead, Tara. Sorry, thanks, Jamie. Um, 
John, I just want to make sure I have the schedule right because this was a question I received from Board of Ed members. You believe that you would be ready for some guidance to the board in terms of what they're looking at sometime within the next two weeks? I will try to get that done well. So we will definitely meet as a board of finance at a special meeting sometime before next Friday, so sometime next week. And at that meeting, what we will do is have the dollar figure that we've calculated and we'll disseminate to the two boards our recommended dollar deferral from each of your budgets. And that will be the guidance that we provide. But we will discuss that at our meeting and actually vote on it so it's a collective view of the board of finance. I also want to make sure our RTM members have a chance to be part of that discussion. So more to come, but you could expect guidance by the end of next week. Okay, thanks, John. John, would you like to touch a little bit about your action on approving the extension of the deadline of taxes due in your meeting last night? Sure, so the state has been wrestling with a few alternatives to make life easier for taxpayers. And so last night the board of finance discussed the two programs that have been proposed, which the state has said to municipalities, you can do one or you can do both of them. So the one that we recommended approving, and by the way, the next step on all this is for that to go to the RTM for a final vote and approval. But of the two programs, the first one we did recommend is a tax deferral program. And so what this means, and just to sort of set the stage for how this works today, is that when we vote to set the mill rate, the first round of taxes, property taxes that will be due are going to be due on July 1st. And you can wait as long as until August 3rd to pay those without penalty. So due July 1st, final due date, August 3rd. So the tax deferral program, the way that works is it defers the payment of those taxes to October 1st. So it's 90 days from July 1st to October 1st, but it really does, it's postponing the final, final deadline from August 3rd to October 1st. And by setting that October 1st deadline, it means that if you don't pay your taxes until October 1st, that's okay. There's no penalty or interest associated with that. So you can defer until October 1st. Importantly, what we decided to recommend was following the OPC guidelines for this, which is to make this program available only to taxpayers with demonstrated need. And by that, I mean you have to demonstrate that your income has been affected by more than 20%, 20% lower because of COVID-19, coronavirus. There's been some aspect of that shutdown or other slow business that's resulted in at least a 20% decrease in your income. And there's a process for applying for all this and demonstrating that. But our recommendation is to adopt that deferral program for those with demonstrated need, in other words, a 20% reduction in their income. And if that's granted and it will be reviewed and approved by our tax collector, I think that's right, Jamie, Kathy would review that? Yes, correct. And if it's granted, if it's granted, then you would be able to defer paying your taxes on due on July 1st until October 1st. So this will apply to any taxpayer who gets, applies for and gets that deferral. The only group that that would not apply to is going to be town residents with mortgages that where the income tax or the property taxes are escrowed as part of your payments. In other words, you pay them every month. So those would be continued to be paid by you monthly. So those individuals or taxpayers would not qualify for this program, but everyone else could apply if they have a demonstrated need. So we did recommend that program to the RTA. Let me stop there. Any questions on that? Just a... Except I had forgotten we had this meeting. I'm glad I picked it up, so I've arrived. Good morning, Seth. Just an administrative point of clarity. So in theory, the town's decision on which one or both of those programs we were going to be offering, and it's important for the public to know that we must we must offer at least one of those. We didn't have a choice to not offer it. So I appreciate the Board of Finance's guidance on that. 
Um, secondly, we were to be giving the Office of Policy and Management notice by April 25th of our final decision, but the RTM is not meeting until April 27th. So I have had to issue a letter asking OPM to extend to us a short grace period to get them the information on which program we are selecting. Kate. Um, one other thing on that, the um, commercial property owners, landlords, can also qualify for that tax deferment, um, but they have to show um, similar income loss or show forbearance to their tenants, that they have forgiven rent to their tenants commensurate with the level of, um, of forgiveness that the town is giving them. Got it, right, that's great. Yep, now, you know, we don't really know what the volume of request is going to be, so I, I need to talk to Kathy and Kate about how we can support the tax collector's office in uh, making sure that we can adjudicate these applications on a timely basis. Yeah, the one thing I would add to that is that uh, an important point for the Board of Finance, and I know Jennifer worked on this, is uh, assessing that impact, the impact of that delay on town finances. So Jennifer ran an analysis that uh, made some assumptions about how many folks would take advantage of this program. So we, we did a pretty generous assessment. We assumed 100% of commercial taxpayers and 5% of residential taxpayers. And we are, are still, we still have plenty of liquidity until the October 1st deadline, even with the relaxed collection rate where we don't impair the, uh, the, the, the town's liquidity in any, any kind of dangerous way. So uh, I think we're, we're safe from that standpoint, accepting this, uh, this program and recommending it. John, I have a question there, and, and maybe John and Jamie, you can help. Um, depending on our assumptions on our collection rate, um, a 0% mill rate increase, are we looking at um, tapping into any of our reserve funds should we need to, um, just given a liquidity factor? Yeah. So the answer to that is if we do these deferral programs, uh, the answer to that, based on everything we can see at the moment, is no. Um, I would point out that we, our current fund balance um, as a percentage of, of, project, uh, of budgeted revenues is around 15%, a little north of that, and it actually will be higher if the Board of Ed ends up returning some surplus this fiscal year, as, as you've mentioned, is, is likely. Um, and so our, our floor for that is actually 12%. And so we are we probably have got around four million dollars in fund balance that we could draw on in an emergency without going below that that percentage floor and that's an important thing to keep in mind in terms of our credit rating which we don't want to impair because you know i know some folks have talked about deferring tax uh, capital projects remember a lot of those capital projects are bonded and frankly this is probably the cheapest time ever both in terms of construction costs and bonding to do these kinds of capital projects. If you believe the world is gonna to continue to go on, then uh, you kinda of gotta say, well, this is really the cheap time to get a lot of that work done. In any case, um, we won't, with that $4 million, uh, my hope is just that with a, um, a modest decline in collection rates, uh, I don't think that we will be in danger of either uh, running into a liquidity problem or impairing fund balance below our uh, stated floor. Okay, thank you. Um, John, I have two comments. Oh. Go ahead, um, Steve. What, what is, with regards to um, collectible taxes and mill rates being leveled in um, assessments, it, 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 you may want to, in your note, that, um, that what, uh, what the article that you're writing is that if, if you did do work on your house, per se, in the last 18 months, it stands to reason that your assessment probably went up. So even though the low rate stays flat, um, your taxes may go up anyway if, if your assessment went up because of capital projects you did at your house. And then the second, the second one is more of a, more of a question. Do we know the percentage of um, commercial property owners that have their tax taxes escrowed? As I know, in the in the financing world, um, 
I mean, definitely for residential mortgages and mostly for commercial mortgages that I see that the, the taxes are escrowed by the bank. So the bank is actually paying the taxes. It's not necessarily the individual property owner if there is a mortgage on a commercial property per se. I don't have an answer to that in terms of commercial taxpayers that have escrowed taxes, uh, but I will find out. Okay. So I think that's going to change your zero commercial um, collection assumption. Well, in our model to test the, the liquidity impact of all of this, we actually assumed 100% of commercial taxpayers would defer. So right. in, that sense, that, that, in that sense, it makes that, that analysis uh, a little bit better in the sense that not all, that it's impossible to have 100% of the commercial taxpayers deferring. So we'll, we, again, this is all pretty new and kind of last 48 hours in terms of analysis, but we're going to use this coming week to sharpen all that up quite a bit and we'll have answers to all those questions in, uh, in due course. Is we're, we're doing John, the same thing. I'm sorry, go ahead, Dave. I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, we're doing the same thing on the commercial side at, at work. Rent collections for March were pretty much 100%. Um, they were down a little bit for rent collections across um, most property aspects in, um, in April. Um, you know, there, there was a rumor out there that, you know, 20, 26% of retail tenants did not pay their April rent. Um, some of the big, big ones that they were not going to pay their rents. Um, and then on the, on the office side, it, 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 the percentage is a lot less. The, the big question is the month of May, because a lot of the rent, you know, for commercial properties or automatic pay, you set it up and it just pays it unless you stop it. So that's the same in the commercial side and in the landlord side, they're doing the same exact thing that you're doing. But on a different, you only pay taxes pretty much twice a year. That's it. Thank you. So this is Jamie. In my oh. discussions that I have uh, almost every day with commercial business and landlords here in town, that fits, Steve. <clears throat> most most have received full payments for the month of March. Um, April is a combination of of no pays and then forbearance given by landlords to tenants. Uh, and there's great concern over their ability to collect rents for May and June. So I think we're going to see a variety of different impacts here locally. I think the important thing to recognize is that the model the Board of Finance has been looking at is assuming no pain, um, that all commercial property owners will attempt to take part of um, advantage of the deferral. So anything below 100% participation is a benefit. Is a to benefit, us. yes. Tara, did you have a question? Yeah, reduce, reduce yeah. liquidity concerns. So I think it, it, if I look at this holistically across kind of where OPC is probably um, for our group, um, I think, John, the assumptions, and, and maybe Kate too, because I know you and Jen have been super helpful with this, the, the assumptions we put together to kind of understand the town's financial health and well being in, in this kind of unprecedented event are really going to be essential because on the flip side, and, and I know, um, John, you've made this good point, that the school certainly, from my perspective, have um, undeniable contracts that we need to meet and we will, con we will um, continue to need to meet. And in, in some ways, Darian has already exp uh, experienced um, when you aren't meeting those fully. Um, and so what I will need to take back to the board if they're going to make kind of sound financial decisions are, here's where the town is financially, here are the assumptions that got us there, and now we need to um, understand the Board of Finance guidance and make appropriate modifications that don't touch education or educational contracts. So I think the more, the more specificity we can have not to question the assumptions, but to understand the assumptions, will be helpful to people being most productive in those conversations. Yeah, Sorry, John, John, I, I would, I, 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 it makes com complete sense. I mean, there's, there's the analysis that we're going to get through that will give us a dollar figure that gets to a 0% low rate increase. And then once we have that figure, we need to have a discussion about whether it's prudent to say, yes, let's go ahead and get the 
let's get the 0% billing rate increase and let's implement this dollar change or deferral into our budgets. Or we could actually decide, you know, that's a little bit too much, right? Or we could decide that it's simply not possible because of various constraints, either required payments or contracts, to your point, all of that. As much as we might want to get to a 0% mill rate increase, there's actually quite a bit of town expenditure that's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to change. And so that means that the base of spending that could be deferred or reduced to get to a 0% mill rate increase is much smaller than the overall town budget. And so we really have to think about the impact on that spending of these types of changes or reductions and really be careful about not impairing town services or assets unduly. But once we come up with that dollar figure, let's have an active discussion about what's possible and wise and prudent and get to the right answer that balances both the mill rate change versus maintaining our town assets and services. So this is Jamie. I completely agree with trying to be as accurate as possible with our assumptions. The one thing that I do want to acknowledge is the impeccable timing of this crisis in the scheme of our fiscal year and the budget decisions that we have to make. I actually don't think that we're going to know the full impacts of the COVID crisis until probably close to the end of the calendar year. And those impacts may be lesser or greater than the assumptions, the good intentions of the Board of Finance is going to be making. So the one qualifier I would like to ask of the Board of Finance is, whatever decisions that we make, and I come from the Standard & Poor's world where you know, my brain thinks in a worst case scenario basis, but that allows us to be very conservative in our planning. Um, if we plan in ultra conservative way and we find that, you know, uh, well into our new fiscal year that our finances have been more stable than we anticipated, I would hope that the Board of Finance would be working with us to um, look back at some of those deferrals and be prepared to make different decisions so that we can return to the very prudent spending plans that we had all diligently prepared over the last six months. Well, I would agree. Yeah, At some point, we're talking about deferrals. We're not talking about cuts uh, because, I think, as Jamie's pointed out, and I'm sure Tara would agree, we came up with budgets that really had pared back as much as we thought reasonably prudent uh, given the times. Now times have changed, and so what we need to do is just think about spending this money later as opposed to now. So when the circumstances change and we can restore some of that spending, absolutely, we'll have a discussion about that as circumstances warrant. Um, the only thing I just, and, and I know you all know this, but if there's any members of the public, I just want to assure them, I believe, um, I'll speak more for myself, but I think in all our, our conversations, I, I think there's agreement, we all recognize that there are some expenses which cannot be deferred and i've already begun to get emails from parents concerned about their children's individual education plans we recognize those as non-deferrable payments um and so i believe you know the board is committed to honoring the educational plans of children i don't think parents should worry about that just like we have found ways to adapt in e-learning we certainly are committed to providing students with services and that commitment will remain because for a child what we look at as a budget year is a school year um, and that's hard that's hard to make up i think that the board's work will focus around those areas for which we can defer but any any members of the public listening i, I just want to assure them that educational plans will continue to be honored and I would, Tara, I would agree that that's a, that's a town-wide sentiment that, um, as John pointed out, that uh, the goal is to not impact services and, and first and foremost those very important services to uh, the students with specialized plans in our public education system. So we're all very supportive of that. Great. Um, okay, uh, any other questions for John? If not, we will go to Seth. Well, um, we had uh, our uh, first meeting that I can ever remember uh, using GoToMeeting, 
and uh, on Monday night we had a, a meeting of the rules committee, and uh, went great. You know, um, uh, it, it it worked very well. We had Kate there, sort of to help us uh, uh, have it uh, have it run well. Everybody's able to dial in, and uh, we had attendance uh, by almost all the members of the rules committee. So it was great. Um, just uh, uh, some outcomes uh, from the meeting. Uh, we agreed to, uh, we're going to move the start of the meeting, the, the uh, meeting of the RTM on the 27th to 5 p.m. Uh, because there's no point in having it at 8 o'clock at night, particularly since it's going to be a, a virtual meeting. Um, it just, uh, it, it may go longer than normal, and uh, in that case, um, you know, we want to not have people there late at night. Uh, so we'll move a little bit earlier. Um, we'll ask the RTM to support, to suspend the normal rules of procedure uh, because we will be virtual. And so what we'll do is, is do a roll call uh, at the beginning of the meeting to determine who's there officially to record all the attendees. And then uh, we'll conduct uh, the vote, uh, taking the no's and the abstentions first, and then uh, um, with the agreement of the RTM, uh, assume the rest have voted yes. That, that makes it, if we know everybody who's there, uh, it should make it much, much easier to record the vote. Uh, and uh, and to keep the meeting moving. If we had to do a roll call on every one of the items on the agenda, uh, it would take a long time to do it. Um, uh, there, uh, on on the uh, budget uh, and and approving the board of finance to approve the budget for the town. Um, normally. When we talk about the budget, we we have committees report out uh, who have been working on the budget. But at, the, at this point in time, there wouldn't be any reason to do that because the budget still a lot of the work that the board of finance would normally have already done by the time we had this RTM meeting uh, hasn't been done. It's still in the process of being worked on. So uh, at best, uh, any reports would be interim and probably uh, not very valuable. So uh, it was agreed that there would not be discussion of the budget from the committees. The committees instead are organizing to present their thoughts to the Board of Finance. And they're doing it in such a way as to limit, in a sense, the number of people involved so that you don't have you know, every member of the RTM is a member of a committee, and theoretically, they could all be talking to the Board of Finance. And uh, so, we're putting together a way, a, a system, so that everybody's working together, collecting all the comments. But you know, live, in a sense, having a few people uh, present those comments to the Board of Finance. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> when we uh, uh, got done and set the agenda, we combined uh, all of the, uh, we will combine all of the uh, easement resolutions that we were going to do in the March 16 meeting. Uh, we'll combine all of those into one vote uh, because we suspended the rules. And uh, then we'll also uh, put the uh, gift to the uh, to the uh, police department from the Darien Foundation in there. Um, we agreed to shorten the meeting by not taking up uh, Amendment Appendix B. Uh, it's a housekeeping thing for the RTM, and it was thought we could postpone that. So uh, then we'll uh, empower the Board of Finance to approve the budget to the town. We'll uh, take action on a gift to Channel 79 of $50,000, and uh, we'll also take up uh, approving the tax deferral. Um, I talked to Wayne Fox about the tax deferral item uh, and the, the issue we have with the 25th 
of April versus us meeting on the 27th. And he outlined what I guess, Jamie, you're in the process of doing, which is to go back to the state and ask for a forbearance on the 25th deadline to the 27th when we meet. Push comes to shove and they say, no, we can reschedule the RTM meeting to the 25th. But hopefully they will understand the situation and be willing to grant us a couple of days grace here. Yeah, thank you. So that's just another quiet day in the RTM. Thank you, Seth. Yes, that letter is going from my office to OPM today. I can't speak to when we'll get feedback on that. They probably have to be outright, let's put it difficult, not to give us a couple of days here. True. I hope it works. The one point that I'd like to clarify for the public who's listening is this unusual situation that we find ourselves in. If you've been combing through the governor's executive orders, you'll see that for towns that have a town meeting, it is their board of selectmen that must authorize their board of finance or budget making authority to approve the budget. And there's been a lot of confusion over that. We are in fact different than a town meeting. A town meeting is when you have all your residents that um, come and vote on referendums, including budget referendums. We have an elected right. body called the representative town meeting that has not been addressed in any of the governor's executive orders in spite of uh, many of us who come from towns like that looking for clarity. So uh, in this case, as you've heard today, it is our legislative body, the representative town meeting that needs to vote to authorize the Board of Finance to approve the budget. There's no option on that. Um, you know, I raised the question that you know, well, gosh, if, if we have to figure out how to get our 100-member RTM together to, to authorize the Board of Finance to approve a budget, why can't the RTM just get together and do the budget work they do usually? But uh, the governor's executive order was clear. It says the legislative body shall authorize the Board of Finance to approve the budget, so we have no option in that regard. However, what that does mean is that for any other regular business for the town of Darien that is ordinarily done by the RTM, the legislative body, the RTM will still have to gather to do all of that work. So, um, you know, until the, the restrictions are lifted, the RTM should understand that they need to be in a position to meet virtually to do all their normal business. You know, and it's, it's a key point. Uh, the the empowerment of the board of finance is only one of about you know a bunch of items that, that are on the agenda for the RTM. So uh, we we had to meet, um, and uh, thankfully modern technology has made it possible for us to do it. It, it worked uh, with the rules committee. Now there's only 13 members of the rules committee, uh, but. Uh, it's still uh, very much doable. So um, uh, we're all kind of look, looking forward to, to the meeting and uh, with, with excitement. We have some grumbling uh, going on about, well, you know, why couldn't we approve the, the budget? The, the town of Greenwich RTM apparently is going to go with a virtual meeting and approve the town budget. But um, my understanding, I don't know what they're going to do, but uh, town council has said we have to do it the way we're doing it and so that's what we're doing we're we're going to follow town council and and the governor's the way we under we interpret the governor's uh, you know uh, pronouncement and uh, we're going to follow that methodology no reason we can't uh, i'm sure john degrasse is just <laughs> thrilled with the opportunity to have uh, massive dialogue in a way uh, with the RTM, but uh, we're, we're going to try and, and control that too. Jamie, can I just ask a point of clarification and just, just so I'm informed what I'm asked because I've already been asked and, and I, I read the governor's order the same way and that the Board of Finance shall be empowered, um, but I just want to make sure I have all my facts. I thought the executive order, while not specifically mentioning RTM, discusses legislative bodies 
that consider um, the budget. And that's how this was all actually doable because in the discussion of legislative bodies, for us, we interpreted that as the RTM and, the, and therefore they shall empower the Board of Finance. Is that correct? That is correct. It's the legislative body of the town. But um, the nuance is that um, in a town that typically has the a town meeting format where you have your general public coming out to vote on things and making those legislative decisions. Um, the, the governor's executive orders empowers the board of selectmen to become the legislative body for the purpose of making this authorization. Okay, so it's accurate if I get questions, and I did even receive some this morning, that the governor's order is specific in the legislative body. We do have a legislative body, and that's why we are following this process. I'm not sure. That's not yeah, a statement. I, I, okay. I'm, I'm not. I, I think. Thank that, you. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, and I certainly can follow up with you offline. Every community has a legislative body. And ours is the RTM. Ours is the RTM. In towns that don't have RTMs but have a town meeting form of government. It is the town meeting, it is the, is the population as a whole, all of the electors who are the legislative body. So there's the nuance. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand that, that's, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure when it was, the governor hasn't provided guidance with RTN, he may not have, but we have ways of signifying in every town in Connecticut who is the legislative body, and so we are following our charter and our process. Yeah, correct, um, that's correct. And we're comfortable with that. Correct. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Seth. Um, all right, I'll move on to my report. I'm gonna be hopefully comprehensive and as brief as possible. I have a lot to share, and I certainly welcome your questions afterward. Um, it's been a very, very busy time here in Town Hall for uh, your first selectman and our emergency management team and our incredible uh, uh, essential staff here in Town Hall, but let me just give you some high-level information for public consumption generally. We've got 14,000 cases of the virus here in the state of Connecticut, 141 in Darien, uh, 731 cases in Fairfield County, the largest county affected thus far, although New Haven and Hartford counties um, seem to have cases increasing. There's been 1,779 cases of, that have required hospitalization. We only know of eight so far here in Darien. And sadly, there are 671 deaths statewide, and two of those are here in Darien. The largest number of cases of the virus are between the ages of 20 and 70. Uh, however, 520 of the total deaths in Connecticut are in the age group of 70 plus. So for the elderly who contract the virus, uh, it's very, very difficult for them to recover. Stamford is the city uh, of the epicenter here in the state of Connecticut. They have 1,525 cases and then followed by Bridgeport, Norwalk, Danbury, and New Haven. So, you know, the density of population in those urban centers is a contributing factor to uh, the tremendous increase in, in the virus spread. Um, with all that said, I wanna tell you that there's been tremendous challenge in getting uh, solid, timely, and data that has integrity. Um, the systems, from what I understand, the state of Connecticut are, are decades old and they're not able to respond. So we have actually hired a new staff member, a nurse, to help us reach out to all of the cases here in Darien so that we can understand on a more granular level the details of their case. What isn't being reported at the regional or local level are recoveries, hospital discharges and recoveries. And in my opinion, this is essential information for all of us to have some hope that we are, uh, you know, hoping to move on from this virus. Um, without that information, it's really difficult to make good policy decisions. We are very fortunate that we've been able to forge a great relationship with Murphy Medical Associates to do COVID testing here in the town of Darien. They're now running testing two days a week. 
Monday afternoons, except for this week when we had a nor'easter on Monday, so it happened yesterday afternoon, and Friday mornings from 9 to 12. Mondays 1 to 4, Fridays from 9 to 12. Um, we are hoping to also work with Murphy Medical when the antibody testing becomes widely available. It is not yet available. Uh, and that's unfortunate because I see that um, in the information coming from the governors that, that this testing will be central to uh, the plan for reopening businesses. To that end, this week, uh, Governor Lamont and his colleagues in the uh, other six states in the Northeast region uh, are putting together a task force that will include a public health representative, a business representative and the governor's chief of staff from each of those seven states. And they will be working on a coordinated plan to hopefully begin to open up uh, business and schools and life as we know it. Um, unfortunately, with New York being the epicenter of the virus in America uh, and New Jersey right there behind, um, I, it would be reasonable to believe that the openings of businesses will necessarily follow the schedule that will be applicable to those states. And I think that what that might mean for us is that we might um, all be a little bit more delayed in the reopening of business than we had hoped. Here at the local level, um, our first meeting of our emergency management team was back on March 3rd, seems so long ago. Uh, on March 10th, the governor issued a declaration of civil preparedness and public health emergency. On the 12th of March, uh, the public schools were closed. And on the 23rd of March, town hall went to an essential staff only model. That means of the typically uh, 180 people that we have uh, working on the town side of government, um, we, we only have now about uh, our 48 essential staff members and our sworn police officers. Our, our police officers, our volunteer fire, and our local EMS are our hometown heroes for sure. Uh, I'd also throw into that definition our grocers, our pharmacists, and our local restaurant providers who have been um, keeping us as well supplied as they can given the challenges with um, uh, you know, supply chains, etc. cetera. Um, but what I'd also like to point out that, that really has gone unsaid to this point is that um, the 48 people that come into this building every day, they are also your frontline first responders. As I said when this meeting started, um, business is as usual in a modified form, really, here at Town Hall. Um, there's no work that's going undone. We don't allow the public into the building other than by appointment only as necessary. But the folks here in Town Hall have done yeoman's work to move services online, to put all forms online, and to accommodate every single request that comes their way, including the people that might come from New Jersey who need to get a marriage license. We are one of the only town clerk's offices that is operating in Lower Fairfield County that will accommodate people who want to get married. So I really want to extend my gratitude to all of my staff and to our custodians who meet us every day at the back door with masks on and a smile underneath those masks. Um, so moving on from that, since the governor issued his emergency declaration, he has issued 27 executive orders. Uh, and those executive orders, uh, you can see them on ct.gov slash coronavirus. There's good summaries there and also the PDF of the entire order. They cover all aspects of our, of our lives, including public health protections, healthcare and nursing home facilities, setting limitations and prohibitions on all aspects of our normal lives, businesses, social gatherings, schools, and government administration including what you heard today about budget adjustments and elections. Our primary, uh, presidential primary, is now scheduled for June 2nd. Uh, it's been postponed from April 28th, but um, I'm not sure if that schedule is even going to hold. Um, the governor has also issued an executive order that puts specific limitations on local chief executive officers 
that we cannot issue orders that are in conflict with his. I think generally that makes good sense, but it certainly um, impedes uh, local, local management in some respects. And I won't go into the details of that, but what comes to mind immediately for me are uh, parks, beaches, golf courses, and boat clubs. And we've had innumerable conversations about those things um, with no answers from the state. Um, our social rules, our gatherings, and our distancing are still in place and will remain in place until the governor lifts those bans. People cannot gather in groups of more than five, and you should at all times in public settings be distanced by at least six feet. If you're outside jogging and biking, it should be even more. I do want to take a moment to thank the public school system for all of their help. Uh, through the challenges of in the nice weather, helping us to manage the gatherings of young people. I don't blame them, they're young people, they feel invincible, but our parks and beaches and the school grounds have been of particular concern and hence the local order that I issued to close the Darien High School to vehicular traffic. I believe that that's had a very positive impact. In terms of communication, um, we have daily communication with our emergency management team, which includes the health department, human service providers, all of our first responders, the schools, and town administration. Uh, all chief electeds in the state of Connecticut have a weekly call with Governor Lamont. That typically happens after he's gone to, out to a press conference, so sometimes our, ta our information lags from what the public has. But he, uh, his administration has been very accessible to us for uh, answering of detailed questions as they relate to his executive orders and then things that he has not ordered. Um, I attend weekly White House briefing conference calls. You know you've been getting code red messages from me, some uh, voice messages, some email messaging. We, uh, Linda and Karen in my office have done an amazing job posting on the website. We have a COVID-19 section that is um, you know, robust with resource guides of all kinds from the local, state, and federal levels on all programs that are being provided. I want to thank Krista McNamara and Sarah Newman for uh, their eyes on that and to be offering additional resources for us to post and for all of the nonprofit providers that have also given us resources to make available to the public. We're using the town's Twitter page. We do not have a town Facebook page, and that's purposeful. Oh, <laughs> well, a case looking at me that we do have a town Facebook page, but I guess, <laughs> Kate, are you the manager of that? Yes, and I've been posting to it. <laughs> OK, so now we know Kate posted the town Facebook page. Um, uh, uh, you know you've seen things from my own social media accounts. Um, I've been sending uh, daily emails back and forth to uh, town residents that have been making inquiries with me, and Wayne Fox and his Curtis Brinkerhoff and Barrett team have been invaluable. Um, we spend hours on the phone virtually every day um, trying to understand gubernatorial orders and other things. Um, uh, shout outs for volunteers and donations. It's been incredible as it always is here in the town of Darien but specifically during this unusual time. We've received donations of personal protective equipment, PPE, to our first responders from groups like the Chinese American community in Darien, the NFL Alumni Association, Masks for Heroes, and we even have volunteers from our own RTM and their friends who are making cloth face masks for our food service workers across town. Uh, Human Service has received um, if somebody, if, would you guys mute your, your phone call, please? There's a lot of in, interference. Thanks so much. Um, uh, donations to our human service department. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, our schools have been giving funding to our human service department to uh, give food gift cards to our human service clients. And uh, the Community Fund of Darien has a robust Touch of Life Fund specifically to support our Human Service Department. Volunteers have helped at Palmer's Food Market 
to shop and deliver groceries to uh, vulnerable people who shouldn't be out in public. And the incredible effort uh, by David Genovese, the community fund, the Darien Foundation called Corbin Cares, is marshalling the, the resources, taking donated monies, and having our buying food from our local restaurants to provide family meals to our human service clients and to the seniors who are used to getting a lunchtime meal at the senior center. So now that it's closed, every day they come and they pick up a to-go lunch, which is provided by our local restaurants through this Corbin Cares program. Additionally, I have organized a mental wellness video series uh, with a, uh, 14 mental health care providers from both the nonprofit and private sector. Five minute videos. Uh, the first one was launched on Easter by uh, Rabbi uh, Cohen. It's fantastic. It's up on our Vimeo on demand platform right now, and the rest of those videos will be loaded in the next day or so, and we'll push those out via social media. Food donations have been pouring into the police department, to our EMS, and to our fire departments. And two great volunteers, jo Jocelyn Alfieri and Karen Brennan, organized with me last Saturday's Ringing of the Bells Townwide, which I've heard has been really very well received. And we're planning to continue that on a weekly Saturday night basis for at least the next couple of weeks. Uh, for local businesses, I have daily outreach to our local businesses, uh, talk to our chamber often. We have been in contact with our local banks to see what programs that they are offering through the Small Business Administration and others. Uh, our, our small business rep, Christine Sullivan, has been fantastic working with town businesses in the chamber. And we're doing specific outreach to our local commercial landlords to see what their impacts are. Just yesterday, um, I began organizing with members of the Darien Men's Association and SCORE. We're gonna be putting together or educational forums specifically for our business community as part of our Darien Business Recovery Task Force. We talked a lot about the town budget already and the tax relief proposals. So that certainly isn't everything, but that gives you a high-level summary of, of a lot of the work that's been going here in town hall and community-wide. And with that, I will answer any questions that you have. I had a quick one for you, Tammy, on, uh, on the testing. In order to get tests, it's my understanding you have to have a prescription from your doctor or something in writing from the doctor. Is that the case? Or? Uh, you can have tests done in one of two ways. Either that way from your personal primary care physician can order you to have a test, or our provider, Murphy Medical, uh, Murphy Medical Associates has a screening process. And through that screening process, if, if indicators are that you have criteria that you should be tested, Murphy Medical will give you that prescription. So you can be screened directly by them and tested by them. Uh, that's me. Okay. Any other questions for me? Okay. Um, hearing none, uh, I think our last order of business is to look at our. Uh, do they have meeting minutes in front of them? February I sent an email to them. Okay, you were emailed February twenty sixth meeting minutes. Do you guys have those? Yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, perfect. So I will entertain uh, a motion to approve our February 26th OPC meeting minutes. So moved. Thank you, Terry. All right. May I have a second? You may have a second. Sorry, was that Steve? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Steve. Um, is there any further discussion or edits to these? Hearing none, um, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstentions? Motion carries. Okay, uh, if there's no other discussion for today, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Seth, thank you. May I have a second? Second. second Tara. Okay, thank you, Tara. Seconds. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you all. Have a great day.